As we've gone through this message series on idols over the last few weeks, we've seen that there seems to be no end to the examples of the dangers of idols that we find in Scripture. We saw the people of Israel uh, made themselves a golden calf, uh, and, and Moses had to lead them out of that sin. Then last week, we saw how generations after Moses, God's people had fallen into worshiping the false gods of the people around him. And these gods were called Baal and Asherah. And God called Gideon to lead them out of that sin. Today, we're going to look at one Old Testament and one New Testament example of idolatry. And just as a reminder, during this series, we've defined an idol as anything that competes with God for worship in our lives. We're going to start out in the book of 1 Kings today. And remember last week we said that as soon as Gideon died, God's people went right back to worshiping false gods. And it's been around 200 years since Gideon, and there have been a long succession of bad kings who have led Israel away from God. And we look, as we look at the, the at first kings, we see that the, a man named Ahab has become king of Israel. He and his wife Jezebel have led the people into worshiping Baal and Asherah again. And Baal is seen as the god of the seasons and fertility. The people who worship Baal uh, are hoping that he'll bring them rain and a good crop. And then they worship Asherah along with Baal, hoping that these false gods would bless them with many children. And because reproduction and fertility was part of what the people wanted from these idols, prostitution and other forms of sexual immorality are part of the worship, along with self-mutilation and all sorts of other things. But God raises up a man named Elijah as his prophet, and he calls Elijah to directly confront the king and his false gods. And like I said, the people worshiped Baal because they hoped he would bring rain for their crops. But to demonstrate his sovereignty, God has Elijah go to the king and tell him that there will be a drought for several years. Not a drop of rain will fall until Elijah says the word. After Elijah brings this prophecy to the king, he immediately has to go into hiding. Jezebel, the queen who's married to King Ahab, has been tracking down prophets and having them killed. And King Ahab has sent people to every known nation to search for Elijah. And you know why? It's because he was right. The word of the Lord that Elijah brought to the king about the drought came true, just as God said it would. But when the time was right, about two and a half years later, God told Elijah to go back to King Ahab. And Ahab tried to blame all this trouble on Elijah. But here's what Elijah says in 1 Kings 18, 18 through 21. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Elijah knows what needs to be done. All of these last couple of years of drought and suffering that the people have been through have been building up to this moment. It's time to make a distinction between the false gods and the one true God. And those same distinctions have to be made today in our lives. Idols string us along, but God demands a choice. God is drawing a line in the sand. He doesn't want his people to waver. He he wants his people to fully commit to him and to trust him. In this story in 1 Kings, God isn't just sending Elijah to preach to the people. This time God is ready to put on a display. And I've always loved this story ever since I was a little kid in Sunday school. Elijah challenges these 450 prophets of Baal, and he says, let's get two bulls. You guys build an altar, uh, put one of the bulls on it, and call out to Baal. And I'll do the same and call out to God. Whichever God answers with fire, he's the true God. And then people all agreed that this was a, a good test. So here's what we read in 1 Kings 18, 25 through 39. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them, Shout louder, he said. 
Surely he's a God. Perhaps he's in deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two sayas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water, and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate, prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Don't you wish that God would do that sort of thing every day, every single time someone challenged his authority or his sovereignty? But this is a rare thing that God only does when it's right in his time. And at this point in time, when his people needed to be reminded of the truth and brought back to reality, God demonstrated his power in an obvious, undeniable way. And through this dramatic display, we see idols look ridiculous in the light of God's reality. Just imagine how stupid the prophets of Baal must have looked, standing there, exhausted from their dancing and flailing, trying to get the attention of this false god, with bleeding wounds that they'd inflicted on themselves in their failed attempts to get a response from a figment of their imagination. Their altar and their sacrifice that sat on it just was untouched, just like it was that morning when they constructed it. While in front of them and all the people was a smoldering hole in the ground where Elijah's altar and sacrifice had been. The prophets of Baal had put on their show dancing and wailing for hours from morning until evening with no response. Elijah had prayed two sentences and God absolutely showed up. And idols in our lives are the same way. We try and try and try again to find meaning and purpose and hope in meaningless, pointless, hopeless things. We spend all sorts of time and energy and effort on things that are incapable of responding to our efforts, while the whole time God is just a breath away ready to respond to us when we call on him. And he will respond, not always with fire from heaven, but he'll respond. And as we move forward and compare what we saw in this passage from 1 Kings with something that we see in Matthew chapter 16, we, we see something interesting. Here we find Jesus and his disciples in a place where no Jew who would have wanted to be considered devout or keep a good reputation would have ever wanted to find themselves. They had traveled to a place called Caesarea Philippi, and it was a city that had been a place of pagan worship for centuries. In fact, in the past, it had been a place of worship to Baal. At the time that Jesus and his followers are, are there, the names of the gods have changed, but their falseness was still the same. In the New Testament period, there were at least 14 pagan temples in the city of Caesarea Philippi. So Jesus and his disciples would have felt surrounded by things that were in direct opposition to the truth. Can you relate to that? Have you ever been in a place where everything just felt off and you knew things weren't right? I've had several times in my life like that, whether it be a person I was talking to or a place I found myself in. I've had times when it was just obvious that things were going on around me that weren't right, and, and I could just feel it. That must be sort of how the disciples are feeling when Jesus takes them to Caesarea Philippi. This place was probably impressive to see with all the temples and the, and the things around him, but 
all the things meant to impress would have been hollow and false. We just saw in the story of Elijah how the light, in the light of God's reality, idols look ridiculous, but sometimes in the light of the world's reality, idols look appealing. There were obviously thousands, maybe even millions of people who were drawn by the appeal of the city and the temples there, by, by the hope that these false gods could provide what they wanted or needed. And Jesus, as he so often does, he cuts through all of this confusion with a couple of simple questions. Let's read Matthew 16, 13 through 15. It says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simple questions, but absolutely profound. Here's Jesus surrounded by all these temples and statues and altars to false gods. And at each of these temples, there would have been followers, many of them prostitutes who would have been trying to entice people to worship these false idols. They would have been claiming all sorts of power. They would have been saying all sorts of things about who these idols were and, and what they could do and what they were capable of. And all of them would have been lies because these idols were capable of nothing. And in the midst of all these lies, Jesus asks his disciples what they had heard others say about who he is. And the disciples tell him, well, you know, people think that, that you're somebody important, but all these people have missed the truth. And people do the same thing today. There are all sorts of people who say good things about Jesus. People say he was a great teacher or he was a great leader or philosopher. And while Jesus was all of those things, that's not even close to all of who he is. And Jesus gets right to the heart of the issue here. He asks his disciples, but what do you say? Who do you say I am? And we see the answer in Mark 16, verses 15 through 18. It says, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In this interaction between Jesus and his disciples, Jesus sets the expectation for his kingdom. And just like God drew a line in the sand on Mount Carmel, Jesus draws a distinction between the world's idea of worship and his reality. Whatever idols we struggle with in our lives, whether it be a personal idol, idol or an idol that we see in our culture around us, whether it's money, pleasures, substances, a, a career, attention from other people, defining our own truth, the false gods of celebrity and fame, or even the idol of our own strength, the question that everything boils down to every time is, who do we say that Jesus is? The answer to that question makes all the difference. Our statement of faith in this church is very simple. We don't have lengthy creeds or doctrinal statements that we ask people to sign or, or to agree to. We simply ask, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and is he your Lord and Savior? If we can agree on that, we, we can find unity on the most important core beliefs of our faith. And we see the importance of the answer to that question and how Jesus responds to Peter. Jesus tells Peter he's blessed because of his faith. And Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to build his church on that statement, that his followers' faith, that he is the son of the living God, is going to be the foundation of his kingdom here on earth. Then, now, and until he comes again. But why did Jesus choose to go to Caesarea Philippi to have this conversation with his disciples? He could have said these things to them as they traveled along the road. He could have told them this stuff when they were in Galilee or, or Jerusalem. Why would he choose this center of pagan worship? The main false god worshipped there at the time was the Greek god Pan. And the worship of Pan included prostitution, or orgies, bestialities, and all sorts of other crazy stuff. And the area where the temples were located in Caesarea was dominated by this huge rock cliff. In the face of the cliff, there were niches where statues of various gods were placed. And at the base of this cliff was a large cave. And at that time, a river flowed out of that cave, and the water from the river made the area lush and fertile. And the people believed that Pan and other lesser gods traveled through the cave and into the underworld, or Hades, in the winter. 
and they would re-emerge in the spring through the rushing waters out of that cave. To the people in Caesarea Philippi, this cave and that river were literally the pathway to the underworld or the gates of Hades. And Jesus takes this opportunity to stand with his disciples in the middle of the center of pagan worship and say, look around. You see what the world does to worship these gods that they have conjured up. But none of this can stand against the truth of the living God and his plan of salvation. Jesus, like the prophets, or just like the prophets of Baal, the people in Caesarea Philippi thought they had to exhaust and disgrace and humiliate and degrade themselves to get the attention of a false god. When with just a few words, the power of God over pagan idols could be demonstrated. In Elijah's day, the power of God came down in fire and destroyed the sacrifice he'd offered. And in God's ultimate plan, his power came down as a man, himself being the sacrifice to pay for the sin of all mankind. So we have a choice to make. Will we be like the prophets of Baal and the people of Caesarea? Will we endlessly chase things that we can never catch? Will we flail and flounder and demean ourselves trying to gain things that we can never really have? Or will we, like Elijah and Peter, with just a few simple words, acknowledge the power of God to change us? Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he is our Lord and Savior. He is the power of God for salvation. That's the foundation of our faith. He is the light that is going to illuminate the true nature of the idols in our lives. He's the truth that is going to set us free to die to our old selves, to leave our idols behind, and to live in the light and the truth of the reality of his kingdom and his church. Because there's no idol in this world, not the gates of Hades or anything else, that can stand against the power of the gospel, the power of God that brings salvation to all who believe. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of the gospel. Thank you that our faith in Jesus and our knowledge that he is your one and only son and that he is our Lord and Savior because of the sacrifice that he made on the cross and the victory he won over the grave, that nothing in this world can stand against that. Not only can nothing stand against it, nothing even comes close and compares. So help us to fight the urge and the temptation that we have to, to elevate temporary false things to the level of the truth. We are often tempted to put things of this world on a level with things of your kingdom when we know that there's no way that they can ever compare to what you have done for us through Jesus. Help us to live for you, to live on that confession and that foundation of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that he's our Lord and Savior. We thank you for all that just those simple words mean. Changes everything. And help it to continue to change us into the people you've called us to be. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.